Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast, with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello there, dozens of listeners to Baha'i Blogcast. Welcome to this new episode. It's me, Rain Wilson. I am your host, and I am really excited to be sitting down with two old buddies of mine who are living in South Africa, filmmakers, producers, on-camera talent, you name it. They do everything. Ryan and Layla Hadarian. Hi, guys. Hey, Green. Hi. So good to see you and chat with you. Nice to see your face on another continent. You guys look uh, amazing thanks to the miracle of modern technology. It's that filter that makes you look better. Oh, it's the filter? Do you guys yeah. have Do you guys have Pokemon Go in South Africa yet? Not yet. Not officially. Okay. All right. Just We're wait. So just wait. <laughs> you can have little kids with uh, iPhones running all around the parks and public spaces, and oh goodness, it's going to be uh, it's going to cause complete and total chaos. So, what's happening, guys? Listen, let's fill the folks in on who you are. So, just Ryan and Layla, just do give me the one minute introduction of who you are and what you do. Boom. Ooh, you first. Ladies first. Goodness, one minute introduction. Okay. Ryan and Layla were parents. We're mom and dad of little Jonah, who's seven years old. We're just two people living in Africa. I came from Europe. Ryan came from the States. We're both in the media industry. And we've been in South Africa for 13 years now. Wow. Doing all kinds of very, very creative, beautiful projects that we probably wouldn't have been able to do had we stayed where we came from. Very true. Very true. God, that was perfect. One minute. Exactly. Go ahead. (laughs) Ryan, you're next. Okay. Well, she said all the lovey-dovey sweet things. What are we up to? I mean, we're always struggling to figure out how to balance work and service and the Baha'i faith with, you know, what's happening in the greater world, struggling after figuring out ways to make enough money to make the, make the family move forward and life be comfortable. We've got a little media company where we distribute, produce, develop, and put together the financing for movies and television shows. Um, Layla is working on her PhD in a book too, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Almost finished with it actually. Yeah. Handing in soon, actually. You're going to be Dr. Hadarian. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> that's fantastic now i met you guys ryan i knew you i think i first met you about 16 years ago in los angeles and uh you were part of a, a little crowd of uh, baha'i artists and filmmakers and musicians and actors and we would all get together and share our work with each other i remember some really great times at your apartment uh there in los Feliz. Then you upped and moved, uh, you met Layla, and then you upped and moved to Africa. What prompted that? Why did you move from uh, Southern California to Johannesburg? Well, it's an interesting question. I remember the whole thought of it was just so foreign. (laughs) Like, had you asked me three months before it actually happened, heck, three weeks before we actually made the decision, it would have been an impossibility. I literally thought I was pioneering in Los Angeles from Texas, you know, Mm -hmm. working in the film business, you know, at the time, I think I had done a few episodes of episodic television and gotten the director's guild and thought, oh man, I've made it, you know, agents and managers and all that kind of stuff that makes you feel legit when living in Los Angeles and Mm -hmm. going from a struggling filmmaker. But then I met Layla, after, you know, going, uh, we met overseas. Uh, we could tell you that whole story at <laughs> another question. But um, she moved, you know, we got married. She moved to L.A. And she kind of got sucked in pretty quickly to the L.A. life of, you know, I got to make it happen. And at the time, she was um, a journalist and was working for, you know, one of the local television stations, KTLA, in the morning news program and was doing some writing for one of the local newspapers And we got this call from a good friend of ours who was in L.A., which was Mark, and him and his wife, Suzanne, were in uh, Mark Bamford. Yeah, they were they were um, very dear friends um, and had gone to South Africa and were busy prepping this first film uh, called Cape of Good Hope that he was going to direct in Cape Town. And he said, you know, why don't you guys come? And my life at that time was, you know, we would 
spend 50 weeks out of the year schmoozing, going to lunches and meetings, and maybe two weeks out of the year you actually shoot and made any actual uh-huh. money that paid off the credit card debt that you accrued the whole year before. Sure, sure. So <laughs> getting up and going for three or four weeks to South Africa and Mark saying, hey, I'll pay for the ticket, it was like a no-brainer. Of course, we'll come and you know help in whatever way we can to prep this movie. Layla was like absolutely Well, I said it. no. I didn't want yeah. to go. I had just gotten this, this other gig. Um, I was writing entertainment news for this entertainment news aggregate aggregation site. And um, I felt like, you know, I really had to be there and do that. And, you know, it barely paid my gas money. I remember (laughs) I couldn't even fill up the gas with what I was getting paid. But I got fired one morning (laughs) for um, publishing a date wrong. And um, literally, just like in the movies, like they gave me a box to put my stuff in. And I walked out (laughs) with my tail between my legs. And then did you have a sad little potted plant that you put in the box? (laughs) And then when you walked out of the office... it was hanging over the side. I just remember her telling me, you know, you know, I have to let you go today. And I and just to keep my dignity, I said, can I just finish today's work? And she said, uh, OK, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I t- <laughs> With everyone looking at me funny. And then when I got in the car, Mark called and said, um, you know, I got you guys tickets. So then there was really nothing in the way of us going to this place that I had no concept of, just had this very remote idea I knew about Nelson Mandela, and that's about it. I had no other concept of what this country would be like. I mean, I knew it was awesome because I had come to visit Mark and Suzanne before they had moved there. Like in 1999, I did this little globe-trotting trip, and I was like, man, that is a beautiful place. Of course we're going to come. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it, Leila. And sure enough, it was a, an amazing time for those three or four weeks, but literally every single day, we got the pioneering talk from Mark, <laughs> like the Matrix talk. You need to take the red pill or the which one are you going to do, the red or the blue? You need to wake up and realize, like, how are you being of service? You know, he kept throwing this stuff back at me because when I met him, God, that must have been like 95. Like he was, I think they were investigating the faith or something. Uh-huh. I don't know. And I was working on this like epic short film about racism that was like meant to be like a fireside tool, right? Right. That, like. It was my way of being of service before doing some schlocky Corman movie or something. You know, that was like my thinking. Mm-hmm. So let me do this thing. And he was like, that's why you came to L.A. Like you wanted to make stuff that mattered. And how are you doing that? I was doing like a USA Network before USA Network was cool. Like Bounty Hunter show that got canceled after like two two seasons at the time. He's like, yeah, you know, stay. And then so literally we would sit and... I mean, I would, I would sit and pray and meditate and like, I would, you know, he would, I would say, okay, if a bird flies out of this tree, we're meant to stay in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, a bird would fly out of the tree and you'd go like, oh no, but birds, and it was like a nightingale or something, like something really oh, symbolic. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, then I'd second guess myself and say, no, wait a second, birds live in trees. There's millions of birds in trees. That's not really a sign, you know? So it was like every day we'd go through these until the day when we went on a tour of one of the townships and we heard the story of Amy Beale, which was this white Fulbright scholar who had come from Southern California um, to help register voters for the first democratic election. And she was taking a coworker home after a voting drive into one of the townships outside of Cape town. Some youth who were just at a political rally for one of the other kind of black separatist political parties that was up and running at that time. And their slogan was one settler, one bullet. And they saw this little white girl and they attacked her. And these three young guys ended up killing her at this corner where the tour guide was telling us the story. And there's a little cross there at the little gas station. And he says, the story doesn't end there. You know, after these guys killed Amy, they were arrested and they were put in jail. And a couple years later, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings happened in South Africa, they came up for amnesty. And so her whole family from Southern California came down to listen to the testimony of these guys asking for amnesty because it was a crime that wasn't intended to be specific to her, but was caught up in the political changes that were happening at the time. And the parents listened and ultimately said, let the kids go. This is what Amy would have wanted. Hmm. And then we're like, wow, that's really touching. It's so, you know, what a story of forgiveness. And they're like, no, the story doesn't end. And then they set up a foundation in the name of their daughter doing these education projects in the townships to uplift the youth. And the guys who killed their daughter worked for them. 
and they call them grandma and grandpa. And it's oh like my fun. gosh. Yeah. So literally we were like, whoa. So we come back to the, to the house and Layla actually writes them a letter, like a physical letter. It was like pre-email. I mean, there was like dial up here at the time. Like you couldn't, there was no like, oh, wow. so we wrote a letter. We went to the post office and basically said, I mean, you paraphrase. Well, I was just so in, you know, inspired by the story. And I, I thought, you know, if there's any way I can make a difference and contribute whatever skill I have, you know, if they need someone like me, I could come and work there. So I sent that letter off and Mark said to us, that's really funny because mail here takes about three weeks to get anywhere. But the very next day... Because he, he kept saying, take a step, take a step, yeah. and you'll know if you're going to be guided and if it was meant to be. And, wow. and he was he was dogging the step we took because he's like, that's not a real step. You got, And we were leaving, leaving, I think, in five days. Like, it was our last week. Mm. So we laughed about it, right? The yeah. Ne- the next morning... We were at breakfast. And we got a phone call from from Linda Beale, Amy's mom, basically offering me a job, wanting me to come in and meet her. And basically what had happened was the same post office where I had dropped off the letter was the same post office she would pick up her letter. So there was no time in no transit. Delay. Uh-huh. delay. And she, she said, we, I never open the mail. It's yeah. like, I, I'm in the country three times a year. And... This happened. So we felt like that was a confirmation. <laughs> it was a serious confirmation. And then Layla, like, we went to drop her off, me and Mark and her. And then me and Mark drove around and had coffee while she was in the interview. And she came out. She's like, we're absolutely staying. <laughs> we're like, what? Okay, wow. <laughs> How much is it going to pay you? And it was like a, a stipend. I think it was like. Well, don't, yeah. Well, it was, but it, was, it was so low that, okay, clearly we couldn't, like, start a life with it, you know? Like, sure. And the whole idea of me still trying to play the the game I was playing in LA it was a br- it's really brutal to fly from South Africa to LA it's like the worst it's so long so that whole idea just didn't make sense and then Mark was like you know I had done I had directed some commercials in the past and he's like the commercial business is really big in Cape Town why don't you go meet a couple companies why don't you take your step you know I said okay so he literally set up like three or four meetings with production companies mm. and said go and see them so he dri- and he was like the chauffeur, like he would give us the Matrix talk and drive us and say, like, you know, you got to figure out how to to be of more of service in your life. So we go to the first one. And before we get out, I don't know, if, were you in the car? Like, did he make you witness it? I or think something? I remember because like, he said something like, what would it take for you to stay? To stay? Like, what would they have to say to you? Yeah. And I said, I, I guess they'd have to give me a retainer, you know, some like enough money that we can live where I don't have to actually be shooting a commercial, you know? So the risk is kind of taken away. And he said, okay, let's shake on it. And we said, okay. So I shook on it and Layla was like the, the witness. And I went and literally every one of them, the guys, every single company we met offered me a retainer. That's amazing. So, and that, was like, that was like three days before we were leaving. So it was like, we couldn't say anything after that. It was like, okay, let's try. The decision yes. was made for you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it should have really... been. A, it should have been enough that the bird flew out of the tree. Yes, I know exactly. <laughs> but uh, it took a lot more confirmation than that. So, so that's fantastic. Yeah, so, so we went back to LA for like two weeks and packed some stuff, left all the little gifts we got when we got married or whatever, and came back to South Africa into a furnished apartment that one of the companies organized for us and and began our life in South Africa. Amazing. Amazing. I remember you guys just moved in a, in a flurry. It just happened so quickly, but that's one. I don't even know what to tell people. I mean, people were very surprised at our, at our decision. Oh my gosh. My, my like film reps or whatever thought I was insane. Yeah. They were like crazy. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, look, we're going to try it out. It'll be like six months. We'll see what happens. You know, I'm on the you know phone and, and here it is 13 years later. 13 years later, and those guys calling me for advice on putting together projects now. It's crazy, you know, like the complete shift in a way that you would have never imagined the career path would take you because of opening up and going down a path that started now, to make had you guys prepare. had you guys stayed in Los Angeles, you know, Ryan, you might be a big TV director, a commercial director right now, and Layla, you might be an on-camera big talent. Do you feel, do you feel bad, like you maybe have made a... a too much of a sacrifice or do you, do you regret the move or do you wonder what if you had stayed? You know, um, those thoughts came up early on very often. 
Um, but I think the last 13 years have really been a journey of not, you know, I think there's been confirmations the way Ryan has told you, and then there've been challenges and failures and things not working out. And it's been such a process of, I don't know, cleansing for me in a way where, to be quite honest, I'm working on not having any wants and desires of that nature anymore. I don't, I don't, I, I don't look at that life and say, oh, I could have done this or I could have done that. Um, I just feel like I don't want anything anymore. I just kind of go with what's there, what's around me, what is the, where, what can I do? What opportunities are there? You know, there's, there was a moment I remember when I really wanted to do something and be of service and use my talents. And I said to God, you know, you know, I'm pretty articulate. I, I'm good on camera. Why don't you give me a big opportunity to shine and, and touch people? And I said to myself, my real sincere motive is to touch a lot of people. And in my email at the time, there was this email from, from the Persian Baha'i Media Services. And they were looking for someone to host a Persian show, like a live coaching show for audiences in Iran that was inspirational. And I had sort of not looked at that email because I was so caught up in my own you know, vision of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in mainstream TV and doing this. And, and then I looked at that email and I'm like, here's your opportunity to serve. Here are people, here's an audience, here's an opportunity. Why don't you just take it if, if inspiring people is really what you want to do? And so I started doing that. And I think that was just one moment in this journey of learning that you just somehow need to be a lot more humble, be a lot more accepting, acquiesce. Mm -hmm. You you always say embracing uncertainty. Yeah, embracing uncertainty. That's like my new life motto. Actually, for me, it was like, it was such an early lesson because when we moved to South Africa, Layla had the real job, right? She, She was like every day being fulfilled. She was going in to do these township projects and like, you know, crazy cool stuff in the townships, right? Every day she'd come home with this awesome story and I'm on a retainer. Like I don't go to the office. Like it's the dream I always thought I had, which is pay me and I'll just sit back and be creative and come up with ideas. It was so depressing. <laughs> Literally. Really? Never, so like, how many times can you go up into the woods and try and dream up a story? I mean, I, you know, I like to write, but not, it didn't work for me. Right. And then we got these opportunities that if I was in LA, if someone said, come do, a PSA for me or come do a little documentary about these orphans. Like literally if I didn't have an editor with the latest Avid system and I wasn't shooting on 35 millimeter film, I wouldn't ever have said I'll do it. And in those first six months, that's what we did. We, we did a tiny little AIDS orphan documentary where we tracked these kids lives for like almost an entire, like every month we would go back or we did a PSA campaign for her, for her um, NGO. NGO. And, and it was like every time we did it, we just felt so good because it was like the time you would have spent or I would have spent in L.A. going and having a lunch here and a pitch there. We were doing these things that were actually having an impact. We yeah. really felt good about it. You were actually making like, things that, that touched people and affected lives. Now, mm-hmm. speaking of that, you did a – you did a, is this what you're referencing? And I remember you did a commercial – that uh, was super powerful about race. I remember seeing it years ago, but it was so impactful and uh, inflammatory yeah. that they didn't run it on the air in That's in exactly Africa. the one, yeah. It was 2004, I think. Yeah. It was that first year we were in South Africa. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was for the foundation, and it basically, the tagline was, um, only education can change, change. change the future. And it was like little kids staring into the camera and saying things like, you know, in 10 years time, I'm going to give your daughter AIDS or in 10 years time, I'm going to be in a prison getting three meals a day with a roof over my head and you're going to be paying for it, you know? And it was like, the tagline was like education, only education can make a difference. Wow. Or that's hard hitting. I know. Great. And, and you know what? We did that thing for, for nothing. Sure. We just felt so good about it. And then all of a sudden the rewards were so spectacular. Like the thing won, like the Clio's for best campaign, like a bronze, which is like the Oscars of commercials. Mm-hmm. In 2004, like up against not just PSAs, like all things. It was crazy. 
So super duper fulfilling. I remember one thing Mark told us um, when we wanted to make that move. He said, the things you're doing in L.A. are things that there are thousands of people waiting in line to do that. That will get done. That show that you're doing, someone will be there to do that show. It will get done, whether it's you or another director. But the things you could be doing here are actually quite unique. There are, there are unique stories to be told that no one is telling. There are other people who have stories to tell that you could help, whose careers you could help. And, you know, Ryan ended up in Johannesburg spending, I think, seven years at the, at the government's film financing um, arm, which was really an institution that helps young filmmakers tell stories that need to be told about South African culture, about the struggles of people, and it helps develop talent. So he really had an impact on... On people. Well, that's it, a it, really it wasn't about his career. It was about developing all these but, other But that's people. a massive shift. Like, all of a sudden, we got to a point where it was like a year into that retainer. And the commercials guys, we won that awesome award for that PSA, but it was really hard to market this non-South African guy to the ad agencies. So I wasn't actually shooting any commercials or making any money for the company, right? Mm. And we knew that that retainer was going to be taken away real soon. We had bought a house. It was wow. like we, had, yeah, we we were we were in it, and then this friend who I'd met years before, like in 1999, when I had come to South Africa the first time, he was running this government film arm, and he came to Cape Town. He's like, "What are you doing in Cape Town? Why don't you come to Johannesburg and be a suit, basically, like be this development executive slash production executive at the government's film finance arm?" And I remember sitting with Layla, going, "I don't know how to do that. I've actually never had a job where I go in from nine to five, like." <laughs> And we had went to Johannesburg for like half a day one day. And we thought, what a pit. We'll never live there. That's like <laughs> the worst place. We are living in the beauty of nature in Cape Town. And we said, okay, if it's meant to be, it'll be. And we decided, again, not the test of a bird flying out of a tree, but we said, if this house we bought, like six months we'd own this house, right? In America at that time, you would you had to hold it for like two years before you would lose money, you know, if you for it to not lose money, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Transactions and stuff. And we said, oh, it was an old house, like a hundred-year-old house. We can't rent it out. Like, we were very nervous about that financially, like what it would do. And we said, all right, well, let's just stick it on the market and see what happens. And three days later, it sold for like 60% more than we had paid for wow. it. And it like literally wiped out all the debt that I had accrued in, in the U.S. It was, it was such a confirmation. We yeah. said, all right. And we went to Joburg and it was, and it was a career move that I would have never in a million years. I remember Joshua Hominick turning to me and going, you should be a producer, man. You should produce. I'm like, no, I'm a director. I'm not going to produce. Like, you know, I'm, I want to be creative. And for six or seven years, it was one of the most fulfilling things was to basically help people to further develop their projects, help them put together additional financing, like really become this suit and, it was a real, real lesson that that's you just keep reminding yourselves. Like you, we never would have guessed that. Mm -hmm. Like if tomorrow you told me you're moving to Inner Mongolia, yeah. Now I could actually go. Okay, it could happen. I don't know. You know, like who knows where I'm going to end up in a year's time. Well, there's there's a there's a very powerful lesson here, and I'm I keep thinking about how to sum it up, and I can't quite do it exactly. I think that I'm I'm really uh, moved by your story. I, I truly am because. You were always asking for guidance from Baha'u'llah and you were always putting service and faith and surrender to God's will in front of your own wills. You know, it, it, had it been your own will, Ryan, you'd be the, you know, the staff director for Bounty Hunter USA, you know, yeah. and, and, and Layla would have been the, you know, the... Uh, well, Oprah or, or, you know, the KTLA version of Oprah or whatever, yes, that's 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 whatever that is. And uh, so many strange doors have opened and it's not quite what you've expected. But I think it's a tough thing for a Baha'i artist or kind of any artist of faith. At first, you want to develop your career like I did. And, and my career kind of subsumed everything else. I was just lived for a career for, you know, 10 or 15 years. And... I'm going to interrupt this message by saying that there's a little boy in his underwear coming up behind you uh, on the Skype. Who's that? Say hello. Who, who are you? Say hi, Jonah. 
Do you remember Rain? We went to his house once in L.A. a couple years ago. You played with Walter. How you doing? Nice to see you. Can't get to sleep, huh? Nice to see you, too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Go take some bread. You can do it yourself. Yeah, make a peanut butter sandwich. Yeah, do it. You know how. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, so many young artists of faith have their, it's all about their occupation. And then I think there's this kind of misconception that a lot of artists feel like, oh, I'll use my art to be of service. You know, I'll, um, if I'm an actor, then I'll MC Holy Day events. Or if I'm a singer, <laughs> I'll play music at uh, Fireside. Uh, and, you know, um, if I'm a visual artist, I'll, I'll do the feast letter or, or whatever it is, but that's really not how it works, you know? And if you looked at the early heroes of the faith, you see so many sacrifices being made for the faith, uh, and people taking incredible leaps beyond what they ever thought themselves Capable. I mean, I think uh, I forget if I told this on the podcast before, but I always think about William Sears, who was just at the height, just not even at the height, like just beginning to inch towards the height of his fame as a as a television personality, as a as an on camera personality, as a sportscaster. When the Ten Year Crusade came out, and Shogi Effendi said, "You know, gotta go." travel and he packed it all up and left New York City and um, a top rated television show and moved to South Africa and those are the kind of sacrifices that are um, that we're called to give so I just wonder what other, I mean, what other spiritual like, lessons you might have in that in that vein I mean it's the same thing that we keep getting reminded with it's a challenge all the time right with regards to like getting actively involved in the in the plans right you know um in the core activities mm -hmm. um because every day you you get a bit busier and you know you you constantly have to remind yourself that there are things that matter you know that that are our, our acts of service are much more um important than really anything else right um especially in this belief system so and doing whatever it is you're doing with presence and love and care, whether you're making tea for someone like I'm just at a point in my life where I was just visiting my family in Austria and I was thinking, had I stayed here, what would I be doing right now? And I'm just at a point where I I mean, this sounds funny, but I honestly feel like, you know, if I had to work in a grocery store or if I had to do anything, I would just do that and I would be there and do that and, and love it. You know, I, it, I don't have that need anymore to do something specific. I'm very thankful for the fact that I'm able to do wonderful things in the field that I, that I love. Um, but I, I'm not that attached anymore to that. You know, I don't feel like that has to happen in this way. And it's just, I feel like it's been a blessing that so many things that I wanted didn't work out for me. Like, I feel like that's God's gift almost. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, we have this, uh, I've had this conversation with a few friends back in the U S who, um, kind of up in age like me <laughs> and who ended up going down a different co career path than what they originally wanted in the media space. Right. Like it didn't work out. They didn't become the director that they wanted or, mm -hmm. or the writer they wanted. And, and there's this real bitterness in those conversations about like, why did it not work for me, but it worked for so-and-so? I mean, I had friends who have stopped kind of being on social media because they don't want to see all the great successes of their, their other peers, right? Mm. And they're going, how, do you, how can you not feel like that? And it's, it's so true because, like, in the career path, I'm not doing what I thought I would want to do. Like, yeah. my whole dream, I thought I was going to be a director and, you know, I mean, I feel like our own worst enemy is is it, your own well, plans. Yeah. And yeah. your own like, just, like just being very stuck and and wanting to fulfill your desires at any cost. I think that that often. Well, what you're talking, what you're talking about is Satan. You know, you're talking about Abdul yeah, Baha's definition even. of the insistent self and yeah. the insistent self doesn't just mean money. I mean, it's it's, you know, fame and status. Uh, are, are huge temptations. 
uh, that I've struggled with and dealt with and, and many Baha'i artists have as well. And um, so you're really talking about Layla being freed from the uh, insistent self. That's right. Um, and I feel like it's just been, it's, it's a very liberating sort of process that we've been going through um, because I often wake up and I'm like, I don't want anything. I, I, I really, I just, I love and I pray and I just try and have faith. And I think also becoming a mother is part of that journey because nothing else matters anymore. You, you have this child and your priorities shift and you realize that there's so much more to life than, than I don't know, whatever you thought was important. Mm, yeah. And speaking of which, uh, shifting gears a little bit, Leila, I saw your TED Talk that you gave in Austria about yeah. Ubuntu. Is that what it is? Am I saying it That's right? That's right, yeah. And, um, Ubuntu. and mm-hmm. this is connected now with your PhD that you're getting and some really fantastic uh, ideas there. Can you, can you give us the nutshell of what your talk was about, how it relates to the Baha'i faith, and how is that has influenced your current course of study? Yeah, Ubuntu was was a notion, it's a philosophy that we discovered when we moved to South Africa. And it was something we first came across in a very intuitive way. We would see it in the way people interact, the way they greet each other, the way they um, take care of each other. And basically, Ubuntu just means I am because we are. It's this notion that we're deeply connected, that we are one, and that, you know, whatever is good for you will be good for me. And it's it's much more implied than it is actually articulated, um, and you just you just come across it in so many different ways. And I mentioned it in that TED talk. You know, we we saw it in the reality shows that they had here, where you know we had come from this sort of we were used to this cutthroat version of all these reality television shows where everybody's trying to put each other down, and and um, these kinds of television shows just didn't work that well in South Africa because people naturally, it came natural to them to support each other and to be, uh, to work in community. So that, that didn't quite, those, those big franchises that we know of all over, you know, the world. Survivor. Quite, survivor. Like what else do we yeah, have? Fear Factor. Like Fear in Fear Factor, factor the U.S. version, the guy is like, walking on a tightrope a hundred feet in the air and everyone's screaming, I hope you fall. I hope you fall. <laughs> and here they You're were like, like, watch out, you know, you know, make sure to not look down, like really encouraging each other yeah. <laughs> to win. And it, it takes away, it, it took away a lot of that sort of anxiety that you had. Like I remember being at KTLA or being anywhere in LA <laughs> or anywhere in Europe for that matter, where you've got that competitive, you know, feeling where you feel like you have to constantly look out for who's doing what so that you can be just a little bit better. Isn't that weird? And there's that's a, what falls away here. There's a, you know, it's envy really. And, and Baha'u'llah, I don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but uh, there's a hidden word about envy that's very um, hard hitting about, yeah. uh, you know, if you have envy, basically you're, you're not going to go to the Abha kingdom. Right. And, yeah. and it consumes your, your organs. Like he talks about, it consumes your, your liver or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, see if we were more spiritually literate, we'd be able to toss out <laughs> perfect quotes right now, but, um, we're spiritual doofuses. The, um, but I, I have to watch out for that for myself. Like, you know, I see on, on Deadline Hollywood or Variety or something like friends of mine or people that I know or actors are about my same age and type getting cast in great roles. And, you know, a lot of times my first impulse is like, Argh! and little horns come <laughs> up like, how did he get that? I didn't even get seen for that project. <laughs> and I have to really like take a deep breath and go, wait a second here, wait all happiness and all compassion and all mercy on all of God's creatures. And this is a very talented actor and they deserve happiness and, and success and, and great roles. And I, I support them. I want to stop. I want to pray for them and for their success. There's enough for everyone. There's enough roles for all of the weird looking, balding (laughs) 50 year old character actors to get roles. And, uh, you know, but it, it does take it takes a little bit of, um, you know, spiritual work to kind of shift mm-hmm. one's attitude. I just feel like that that process you're 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 describing it's always been there, 
it's just become a little bit faster. You know, it's just the switch. I make that switch a little bit faster each time. Mm. Like I think about that show we were going to do where I saw myself hosting the show and I really thought, hey, I've got that personality and everything. And very quickly in our consultation, it became clear that I'm not the right person for the for the show, you know, to, to actually be hosting it. And that we're going to cast like a local South African person who was going to be speaking in one of the local languages. And it made so much sense. And I, I feel like that transition happened so quickly for me to just say, okay, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Whereas before it would have taken longer. Mm. So I think it's just, it's just that ease. There's, there's more of an ease. I, I am trying to think back to myself because I had this chat with a friend re- really recently about like, how, how are you not constantly in this state of mind? Especially when I was, helping young directors mm-hmm. kind of get their foot up. And there was one in particular who um, we really helped, and he ended up doing like a $15 million movie in L.A. from, from like South Africa, like doing mm-hmm. a little short that we funded to that, you know? And, and, I, and I actually stopped and I thought about it, and I was like, there was not an ounce of that because I felt like I kind of had felt ownership on how sure. this guy's progress. It was like the more you were of service to someone else – trying to achieve something the more you yes. felt great about it and it was like this whole this whole spirit of ubuntu in a yeah. way right it, it just kind I of am because we are. everything and and yeah I so think. we we interrupted that discussion about ubuntu so what what how does this influence your course of study right now well i i you know i just i think having given that talk i realized after a while that this is a very important principle it's it's completely in line with the writings of the baha'i faith it's all about um, finding ways in which we can, you know, restructure everything from the way we um, structure family life to community life to governance to democratic systems to media to game shows to reality shows, we can we can restructure everything if we if we sh- have a shift in thinking if we think in terms of I am because we are because right now the world is mostly I am because you're not. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, you know, and so or I am because I did it myself <laughs> without any myself, help. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I'm the individual and I'm at the center of my universe. And it's not a it's not a very happy, joyful place deeply because you can never fill that that you can never feed yourself enough. So. So I was just interested in that. It just kind of developed. I mean, I, I really am not your classic academic type. I've never had those particular ambitions to to do those kinds of things. But I I sort of took it easy and I said, let's just give it a try and see what happens. Let's you know give it a shot. Let's apply. And you know if if these if there's interest and there was a lot of interest from from several professors who are looking at you know for example what are consultative ways of of structuring a talk show? How can we go about that? And I researched and I saw that in South Africa, in fact, a lot of talk shows are very consultative. They are very um, collaborative in nature. People are not constantly arguing and trying to disprove each other. They're actually collaborating to find truth in a very respectful manner. Mm. So that was an eye-opener for me. And I feel like, um, you know, that just ties in with, with everything that I've loved and everything that I've been inspired by in South Africa. And we'll see where that takes me. I mean, this whole concept of consultation, right, mm-hmm. from the Baha'i writings, it, it's, it's so perfectly in line. I mean, yeah. we got exposed to it. Do you remember we were trying to do a little documentary as a means of being of service where we said, hey, let's look at the Baha'i electoral system and how it goes. So we're going to... We're going to film the local election process, like in a little village and in the city. And we're going to yeah. go to the national one. And then we're going to go to the center for the election of the House of Justice. And we actually did this. So we got the NSA of South Africa to give us the permission to follow them. And we kind of made it like a reality show. And when we got to the world, uh, to Haifa, to the World Center for, I forget what was that, like eight years ago or something, one of the uh, United States of Justice members that we were chatting with said, Had, have you read this book? Uh, by Michael Carlberg called um, Beyond, the, Beyond the, culture the Culture of Conflict. Conflict. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no, we haven't. He goes, well, okay, let me make a phone call. And literally locked us in the library until we had finished reading it while we were in there or skimming it up to it. And it literally fundamentally changed the entire course of that little project we were working on where it, it became all about looking at kind of the democratic 
electoral system and stuff that that kind of was not at all being discussed in 2000 Mainstream, yeah, yeah discourses like 2007 or whenever we were working on it 2006 2007 um, about like the pitfalls of kind of western liberal democracy and being beholden to special interests and and they're not really being a win-win scenario ever you know and right. so we start to explore all of these things and and understood that that was so much of where south africa was right and we were constantly saying you look at, at south africa who's gone through all this tremendous pain has has really been so forgiving of like past injustices yeah. and is kind of like on this razor's edge of embracing all those beautiful things about all the African cultures that are steeped in Ubuntu, which is being of service to your fellow man, right? Well, Ultimately. It doesn't it, uh, it takes a village, that whole concept yeah. came from That's this just, African idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they, you wouldn't, they wouldn't give up an orphan. Uh, the orphan no. would be raised by the village. You wouldn't like give it to yeah, some family that I, lived in Topeka. Which is why we had such a hard time adopting a kid because it's actually, you know, people will take care of that child somehow, the community, aunts, uncles, cousins, someone. So it's not that whole idea of when a child is orphaned, they're completely orphaned. Here, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and the idea of, of this like family from somewhere completely different raising a child mm, doesn't sit so well. Mm. doesn't sit so well mm -hmm. with people here. There was two sides, right? There was a Ubuntu side, but then there was like this tendency to go towards this kind of really strongly capitalistic kind of self-motivated, self yeah. I have to get what's mine, what I have earned. Sure, and it's very understandable because there's so much frustration, yeah. there's so much poverty, and, you know, things are not moving fast enough, and it's, it's very understandable that people, you know, want to see change for their, for their children faster. You know, and I think that's why it comes back down to all of us in, in our communities to, to push the efforts that we're, that we're involved in so that we can create happier communities, so that we can be involved in other people's lives and we can help uplift them or help them uplift themselves because it's so vital. This is like, I'm seeing it, like within a 20 year mm -hmm. democratic period, we've been here 13 of those years, you can see the benefits that are gonna come if everyone kind of works together and looks at it like we're all in this together mm -hmm. versus yeah, the both pitfalls discourses. of mm -hmm. what happens if you focus on self and getting ultimately what you want right. uh, detriment of others. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit, you, you hinted at it before Ryan, but you guys, how you guys met is a very special story mm -hmm. and uh, I'd love to hear it. Well, I'm going to tell your version. I, have to <laughs> tell my version. I want to hear both versions guys. Come on. <laughs> so I, I was think clueless. I was like 27. Yeah. Layla was very young. I was super, I was a kid. I was 20. <laughs> So I was 27 and marriage was like the furthest thing from my mind, right? I had my plan, you know, probably when I was 35, become very successful, be financially self-sufficient. And then I'd look for a wife, you know, and, and LA is a, is a fun life for any single young guy I think, in your head. So we go on this family pilgrimage. I think we were on a seven year waiting list. And the first thing my grandmother pulls me aside to say when I go is, you better make sure to pray for a wife. <laughs> and my mom <laughs> says the same thing. <laughs> and, and we're all in this together, my sister, my, brother, my father, and my mother. So when I go into the shrine of Baha'u'llah for the first time, I figure that thing keeps like, you hear your grandma's voice in the back of your mind. You're like, well, okay, even though it's not part of the plan, I, might, I mean, I'm here. It took seven years to get here. I might as well, you know, say a prayer, see if God will guide me to... to show me the path to a woman who can be of service with me and we can uh, work together. And, and as I look up, all of a sudden I feel this tap on my shoulder <laughs> and it's Layla, and you know, in the Wait, of so you're, you're, be... you're literally praying for a wife and then Layla yeah. taps on your shoulder in the shrine <laughs> of Baha'u'llah. Like, for real? Are you first. exaggerating any of this? There, there's, a, there's a little bit of tax. He keeps adding tax <laughs> each time. <laughs> no, there wasn't the, the tap on the shoulder, but I think she was standing up from a prostration or something oh, and no, turning man. back. <laughs> no, no, no. You're we, in the shrine we... at the same time. Yes, yes, that's it. That's it. That that's the only truth to it. And we we got to chatting in the pilgrim house later. And to be honest, I 
was much more attracted to his family <laughs> than to him. I was like, oh, what wonderful, warm people. They're so unified. They're so sweet and caring. His sister, Bita, was like so warm and lovely. And I was like, oh, what a wonderful girl. And, you know, he must be okay if he's uh, part of that family. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, uh, we were staying. She was there for like a three-day visit. So we happened to be staying at the same hotel and ended up kind of running each other into each other in the lobby and chatting. And then the next morning I go down to breakfast and who's sitting at the table with my family but Layla. <laughs> that was like the day she was leaving. And we exchanged emails and... Well, he was traveling still after that. Yeah. So he was still traveling in Europe. I was in Austria. He said, I'm going to be in London. And we met up in London with his cousins and his sister. Mm -hmm. And that year, that following year, there was a lot of traveling back and forth between Europe and the States. And when we did travel teaching together, that was a huge thing. I mean, we, we really did a lot of travel teaching and we, um, you know, took trips to Eastern Europe to do firesides and show movies. And I think the traveling itself sort of brought up aspects of our personality that were worth, you know, when they say you have to investigate each other's character, that was really a period of investigation because we, we had some stress trying to find the right location and figuring out how each of us, you know, reacts under stress. That was a very interesting revelation for both of us. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> and despite bet. all that, we, we yeah. stayed together. Be, being uh, acquainted with each other's character, going travel teaching, uh, there's, there's <laughs> nothing better than that uh, no. than to see uh, the very best and very worst aspects of someone, I imagine. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. So despite all that, we got married. <laughs> amazing. So, where do you guys go now? What are your future plans, both uh, materially and artistically and spiritually? I'd love to hear about what spiritual struggles you guys are might be having right now. Is there a quote that you're especially focusing on these days? And what are the spiritual rewards of the life that you live? I think there's not a specific quote, but there's a phrase, like um, a term that has been on my mind for a long time now. And it's that notion that I spoke about earlier, the notion of radiant acquiescence. And it's like that, that step up from acceptance. And I think I've been practicing acceptance in my, in my family life, at home, in Austria, with my career, with all different kinds of aspects of my life. And I'm getting to a point where I can imagine what radiant acquiescence is like, which is like you're embracing something joyously, spiritually, that is actually outwardly hard and difficult and testing. And to me, that's, that's something that is both joyous and painful, painful to... The material self, painful to the ego because it has to let go of, of things that it wants, but joyous to the soul because the soul grows and is unshackled and is freed. And so mm -hmm. for me, that's, that's my little sort of space that I'm in and that I'm, that I'm exploring and that I'm working on. One of the most challenging things about being a Baha'i is mm -hmm. knowing about the importance of tests and then being told in our faith that you don't just suffer through tests. You don't just like get by through tests and, and pass them. You don't just kind of wait it out until the worst is over and, and hope, hope for the very best. Like you, you suffer through them joyfully with radiant <laughs> acquiescence when you're going through the hardest times of your life. That's what we strive to do. And uh, believe me, I am not even close to being there. So uh, this is really no, yeah. inspiring for me to hear. Uh, maybe, again, it was Mark. We, we keep referring back to him because he was such a spiritual force in our life. But he always said, you know, having faith and not having faith are such a fine line. And I think I feel that all the time. Like, you know, when you are tested in a very big way, you, you're often just so undone where you're just like, I, I have nothing else to say. I don't know. You know, you're just that close to, to losing faith almost. And yet you hang in there and you know that that's what faith is. It's about breathing where there is no air and walking where there is no path and being just hanging in there, basically. So I don't know, you know, it's just the path that I want to sort of find myself on. In terms of our actual projects, 
Um, we're always doing very interesting projects that are fulfilling and beautiful, like our um, township makeover show, which is absolutely beautiful and fulfilling that we're involved with right now. And that really brings in um, spiritual principles and is about helping the community and helping the community help themselves and collaborating. I'm continuing with my Persian blogs. Ryan has been such a great partner for me in terms of really complimenting me. Um, you know, when, when I write something, he'll edit it, and we just work together well, I think. That's great. You know? we, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Ryan? Actually, that's uh, probably the best thing about this whole marriage and looking across uh, a woman in, in the shrine was uh, finding someone that you're a real partner with. Like, mm. it's been really, really awesome to be able to actually kind of work together on a lot of things. Um, and to have that happen, it's, it's, it's been so rewarding. Or the Not A Crime campaign right now that we were working on was just so beautiful. Mm. There was all these interviews with so many special souls that we did. Um, people who had gone through apartheid, who were Baha'is, African Baha'is, and then related their experiences to the situation of Baha'is in Iran currently. And to be able to share that experience with you, mm. Brian, you know, like filming those interviews and hearing those stories and putting that together was just, you know, who gets to do that? That was so beautiful, yeah, right? Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah. So yeah. in the Baha'i Faith, marriage is a fortress of well-being. How do you guys work on keeping it a fortress <laughs> of well-being? How do we do that? Well, it's a real protector, right? <laughs> it, it's been pretty amazing to have a partner. Like I have some friends who are still my age who, who have really like, Oh, should I get married to this girl? Should I not? You know, you hear this, this story, you know, I'm, I just turned 44 and I'm like, man, it's been the best thing. Like all of the things you were scared of to commit, to make that decision. It was like, I can't even look back. I, I felt so foolish even having those kinds of questions, you know, yeah. back 16 years ago, it, it's been such a blessing um, to to kind of grow together, be kind of this unified soul, right? They say, like, it's like two souls coming together in a way in the writing sometimes. And it's not always easy. No. I mean, you know. When you don't listen to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, have, we have our moments and, and, and we make mistakes and we, we, we each have our own little journey. And that's... There, again, it takes me back to those writings about where everybody's their own, gosh, like so paraphrasing, but we're each our own ocean or sea, and we don't quite, right? There's this one quote. Where, where I think we shouldn't like, like stab around for quotes <laughs> that we don't, <laughs> that we don't quite know. Anyway, <laughs> but the point is that, you know, we, we each have our spiritual journey, and we have to work on that and, and, and just being tolerant of that towards each other and just being patient with each other and, and letting each other have that time to grow in the ways that we need to, because we are very different personalities. And yet, you know, being committed and, and sharing life and now having this little seven-year-old whirlwind to look mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting One thing I will say about marriage that was really interesting is that very early in our marriage, we came to a brand new place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, came to South Africa a year, year and a half into our marriage, and I think that had so much to do with bringing us together because it, I didn't have to adopt her friends and she didn't have to adopt. He mine. really doesn't like adopting my friends. I don't know what's uh, wrong with that. <laughs> I love my friends. <laughs> but you know, the idea of like developing a whole life together, like new friends, new place, new experiences. Um, you know, pretty awesome. I, I yeah. suppose that's why you know there's the advice of serving together and. Figuring, you know, when you're investigating other, each other's characters as a young, young, uh, young folk. Um, and staying humble and, and praying. Like, I mean, all around us, marriages fall apart. True. Um, in family, in friends. And so I think it's very important to stay humble and just pray and take it day by day and just ask God for help. And I think when we think of the marriage vows... The Baha'i marriage vows, it's really about leaving it up to God and asking him for help. You know, like we don't, we shouldn't be putting our whole trust in each other because that will never work. But to say, to turn to God constantly and, and sort of ask for his assistance, I think that's, that's the best thing you can do, really. Mm.
Well, that's great. And see how it goes. That's a perfect spot for us to end our little interview. You guys, <laughs> it's been so great having this interview, but just better yet getting caught up with you because I get to speak to you so rarely. And thanks for all of your service and for your service to the country of South Africa as well. And uh, this has been really, really uh, fun and inspiring. Thanks, guys. Thank thanks you, for Ray. having us. Beautiful it was awesome to chatting you. with you. Yeah. All right. And please, can we do it more often? <laughs> do we have to record Just the conversation? Chatting. We don't have to yeah. record the conversation. Okay. No, don't record it. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> so long. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>